Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. <laughs> You've arrived in the right place. We're just waiting for people to drop in. Thank you for being here today. Hello, hello. Thank you for, for joining us today. We're gonna to give it a few more seconds for people to arrive. Thank you for joining us to today's webinar. Thank you, oh, hi Liz. Oh, nice. Some familiar faces, uh, names in the chat. Please feel free to drop in where you're, where you're calling or zooming in from. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yay. Hey, Saren. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Hello, my name is uh, Kati Reusche. I am the Director for International Alumni Networks here at BU. And it gives me such great pleasure to welcome you today. Um, happy Women's Day to all of you around the world. We're fortunate to have four outstanding alumni fe featured in this program today. But before we begin, let me uh, do a few housekeeping notes. I wanted to let you know that this t uh, webinar today is sponsored by BU's Alumni Association. It's offered to our 339,000 alumni around the world. I know that we have alumni joining us today from very far away places. And I invite you again to use the chat to type in where you're zooming in from. Um, for each and every one of you out there, please know that we really do value your opinion for this program. And um, I wanted to let you know that today's recording, um, today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be available on our on-demand library uh, for the, uh, if you go to www.bu.edu slash alumni. We are eager to answer everybody's questions. You can hover over this um, the Q&A button on the bottom or on the top of your screen um, to post your questions throughout the webinar. And let's get started. Let's meet the ladies. Facilitating today's conversation is Nada Farad. She's a COM 92 and a Pardee 93. A senior planning producer at Al Arabia News Network in Dubai. She has more than 20 years of experience in the media and the news industry. And I was originally from Beirut, Lebanon, and she graduated from BU with an undergraduate degree in journalism and a master's degree in international relations. In 2002, Nada joined the CNN in Atlanta as an assignment editor uh, at the international desk, and she was part of a team that covered the start of the war in Iraq. In 2006, she joined Al Arabia as a senior planning producer. Thank you, Nada. I'm turning it over to you. Thank you, Kathy. It gives me great pleasure to be with you today and, and to moderate this uh, webinar on uh, International Women's Day, celebrating inspiring uh, BU alumni. Um, happy Women's Day to all of you around the world and welcome to this panel. There are approximately 100,000 BU alumni and each year that number grows by about 3,000 3, women. It's a powerful number and a powerful group of women in just about every stage of life. We are fortunate to feature some of BU's outstanding alumni today in this program. I'm happy to be moderating and honored to be in the presence of such amazing women. Welcome all of you. If I, uh, I may just say who's going to be on the panel quickly. Uh, we have Minal Anand, who is the CEO and founder of Guru Q. Ivana Solano, who is the founder and executive director of Love Your Magic and Didi Wong, who is the CEO of the Yes Academy, among other things. So uh, let's start by having each one of you introduce yourself. Do you want to uh, start, Ivana? 
Thank you. Yes. So hi, everyone. My name is Ivana Solano. I am originally from the Dominican Republic, but I'm currently living in the greater Boston area. I am a BU Wheelock School of Education graduate, and I am currently the founder and executive director of Love Your Magic, which is a grassroots organization that supports the healthy development of Black and Brown girls through self-advocacy, self-love, and sisterhood. I am really passionate as it relates to empowering Black and Brown girls because I know that that is who I wish I had growing up. So I'm really excited to be here with you all today. Thank you, Ivana. Uh, let's move on to Minal. Minal, would you like to tell us a little bit about you? Sure. Hi, I'm Minal Anand. Um, I'm from New Delhi, India. I graduated um, BU in 2013 from Questrom. I was a finance major. I moved back in 2013 to India, where I started working in my family business and worked there, still worked there. But then um, I think in 2017, I wanted to venture out, do something on my own. And that's how GuruQ came about, which is basically an ed tech platform that connects students with teachers across India. Um, we provide online as well as home tutoring. So of course, the pandemic really brought online to the forefront here in India. Before that, it was primarily a market where uh, offline and home tutoring was at the forefront. So uh, what the pandemic really did was it brought online tutoring um, to the forefront in India. And that's what I've built sort of the company on. Luckily, I started it before the pandemic hit. So we got a head start. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit about me and, you know, what I'm doing and how I started GuruQ. Great. Thanks, Manal. Uh, Didi, go ahead. Hello, everybody. Me. Hello from Los Angeles. Um, thank you, first of all, so much for attending because I know uh, everybody has a choice of how they spend their time and spending it with your fellow BU alumni is uh, really cool. I think it's very early in LA right now. So it's uh, giving me joy to wake up to this beautiful Women's Day uh, with all of you. Thank you, Nada, for moderating. I am originally from Hong Kong and I grew up in England. I know some of you are from Europe. I see somebody from England. Um, and my parents are still there, my family's still there, but I chose to stay in Los Angeles. Uh, I am an international award-winning speaker, and I recently got knighted. Um, so now I'm called Lady Didi Wong, and I do a lot of philanthropy. Um, I also teach speaking, uh, teach people how to become speakers. And I do a bunch of odd stuff too. I, I'm a producer of TVs and movie shows in Hollywood. And I'm an author. I do it. I do a lot of different things. I'm a Gemini, <laughs> so I like to have variety in my life, um, and love to connect with all of you as well. So you can just find me online. So uh, I'm really looking forward to this panel. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Didi. Okay, so our discussion today is going to be divided into two two focuses. One, is we're going to focus on the um, uh, personal aspects, the personal path, and uh, how uh, what you did after BU and how uh, BU influenced what you ended up doing uh, uh, in life. And the second part of the discussion is going to be uh, about International Women's Day and what it means to us and all the other stuff that we're going to be talking about. Anyway, uh, for the personal path, I'm going to start with, uh, how about I start with you, Didi, since I already have you here. Um, when you were growing up, what you dreamed of being as a little girl, uh, how, how close did you get to what you dreamed of doing? Because you have all these things that you, that you have done. Uh, how close are you to fulfilling your dream? Well, I did make my dream come true. My biggest reason for coming to America after studying high school and prep school in England um, was to be on Broadway. So my dream was to go to New York City. After BU, I had to find a visa to stay in America. So it, they allowed me one year to uh, do work experience. So I did go to New York City and uh, I worked for Vera Wang. I did PR for her. And, and by the way, I went to the College of Communications so I did continue my uh, degree, <laughs> what I learned. And um, I went to Vera Wang, helped her with PR. After that, uh, I went to New York City Ballet and I did special events for them. 
And then I said, no, I need to really focus on what I came to America to do, which is to be on Broadway. So um, after New York City Ballet, I actually got a really great job. It was called uh, Director of Public Relations and Special Events for Pier 59 Studios in New York City, which is a huge studio where you work with Madonna, Jennifer Lopez, Puff Daddy at that time, Keanu Reeves. I, I really worked with pretty much all the top A-listers, but I actually gave up that job so that I can chase my dream, which is to be on Broadway. So from that very high paying and very glamorous job, wearing heels and wearing dresses every day, looking be beautiful, um, to the next week when I gave it up to be uh, in a Chinese restaurant doing uh, reservations <laughs> with a supervisor standing over my head and screaming at me and not to give a 7.30 table out to just anybody, um, which was a huge learning experience and a huge journey but I had to suck it up because I really wanted to be an actress and singer and dancer. So all my other free time, I got to go to auditions. Never got anything on Broadway as an actress, but fast forward a few years, um, a few years, <laughs> about three years ago, um, as a speaker, I actually got invited um, for, as a first Asian woman to speak on a Broadway stage, which was so most touching moment, I would say, because I've wanted to be on Broadway so long. I step on the stage and uh, my dream came true. Instead of doing a whole speech, which I did a little bit, um, I actually ended up singing a song and basically took the time <laughs> to make my dream come true. And I sang, um, uh, I sang Over the Rainbow, which is all about your dreams coming true. So I did make my dreams come true and I'm living my best life right now. Thank you. <laughs> That's so great. It's so great and so inspiring. Minal, how has it been for you after graduation and you moved back to India? How, how has it been for you? Um, so, you know, since I was a little girl, I always wanted to, I knew I wanted to be in the business world. I didn't know what, I didn't know how, but I remember when I used to see my dad going to work and like building his business and, you know, usually when children see that and see their fathers coming back home late at night and barely seeing them, they don't want that life. I really wanted it. And I wanted it since I was like, I can remember since I was seven or eight. Um, so when I graduated um, from BU, I came back immediately. And within like a week, I started working in my family business. Um, I wanted to work under my grandfather because he was unwell and learn from him as much as I could before um, you know, he passed away. So that was a big reason for me to come back to India. But being in India, where uh, you know the business world and the ecosystem is completely the opposite of what it is in the US, right? The work ethic is different, everything is different, the way you communicate is different, um, the people around you are different. There's a lot of disparity, um, you know, in terms of uh, people that you work with, and it, it's just a whole different environment. The kind of uh, business environment that you have in India is, I have to say, it's not the easiest to work in, especially being a woman. Uh, so I came back into a manufacturing chemical industry, okay, which didn't have any women at all. I remember when I started working, um, we had, including me, we were three women in the entire company. I remember I used to go for expos and trade shows, and there were no women. They weren't even women bathrooms for women because there weren't any women in the chemical field. So, um, you know, slowly, slowly built the company, learned from the ground up, um, did all of that, went through every possible department from manufacturing to production to supply chain to like name it. And I did it all in those like five years. Um, then decided to start my own company. And um, that is, I think, when like my finance degree and my love for everything business started coming to the forefront everything I learned in BU like I remember uh, you know when I was doing core like our core semester in Boston in the business school um, is a huge semester that you used to have I don't know if you still have that now and if you know that's part of the curriculum but I always used to wonder will we ever utilize this in our real life and I have never really utilized 
what I learned in that core semester until I started my own company. Because from things like creating business plans to like having marketing budgets to like going into the details of, you know, how you start a company, I had no idea what it would entail. But I think um, that learning that I got during that semester in my last year of college uh, at BU taught me so much in terms of how to start a business, how to approach things, how to really um, hire the right people about organizational behavior and a bunch of stuff that, um, you know, usually people are like, do you really use what you learned in college in your real life? And I really did. I really, really did. I still have my notes from BU. I still have my books from BU. So, uh, you know, for me, it was one of the best experiences. And I do have to say that everything I learned in college or most of it, I still use till today. Wow, that's great. Well, good to know because so it, uh, this this uh, encourages girls not to uh, think that what they're going to learn in college does not apply to them in the future. Great. Ivan, I uh, love your magic. Sounds so um, uh, inspiring. Uh, how did you come up with the name and what what do you hope to do with it, with Love Your Magic? What does it do for the teacher? Yeah, thank you so much for asking. So uh, when I graduated college, I decided to choose teaching as my path of social justice advocacy work. Um, and during my time in the classroom, I experienced firsthand the ways in which black and brown girls were treated in schools. Um, specifically black and brown girls experience a lot of adultification, right? So their place, labels are, are placed on them such as like, you're so sassy or you have an attitude. Labels that you would normally place on adults, not so much on young people. And I would also see the ways in which our girls were being criminalized, right? So like our black and brown girls were being suspended at higher rates, were being sent out of class, and they were policed in many ways from their dress codes to the ways that they presented themselves in the classroom and beyond. Um, and that's really what brought about Love Your Magic. Love Your Magic um, came about because we really wanted young girls to love who they are, love everything about themselves, as they are. Um, I think society a lot of times sends specifically black and brown girl messages that they're not enough or that they are too much and love your magic. Even the name itself is just like this idea of loving yourself for who you are, all of the pieces of you and that make you you that perhaps some folks find too complex or too difficult to deal with. Those are things that you should love about yourself. And that's really where the name came about. Um, and as an organization, I think that that's also the message that we really work to um, communicate to young girls, loving themselves for who they are, despite what the world may tell you. Um, there are times that folks will tell you that you have, you're a little too sassy or uh, you're bossy, but in reality, what you are is assertive and confident. Um, and those are all qualities that you should lean into. And so the programming that we do is really focused around having young girls reflect on who they are so that they can have a strong sense of self so that they can then use that strong sense of self to cheer on their other sister friends as we like to call them. Um, and then be able to create change in their communities, right? Knowing that who they are is enough and like who they are is actually really powerful and has the potential to shape the world as they see it in their own terms. And I think that that piece in particular is important. I think a lot of times we tell girls like, you have to go to college, you have to do this, or you have to behave in this way when the reality is mm, you don't. You can be who you wanna be, how you wanna be, um, and that is enough and that is beautiful. And so I think that that is the work that we set out to do every day when we're working with young girls, teaching them that what you are is magic and it is your responsibility and our responsibility as a community to love that and to support that. Okay, how about now? Okay, so this brings me to the question of um, being inspired and inspiring these girls. Do you feel inspired by them sometimes? Sorry, so am I inspired by the girls themselves sometimes? Yes, because Absolutely. You know, they have yes, because because they're still young. They haven't gone through the process of being told yes or no and, and this is right and this is wrong. And and you catch them at the, at a young age where they may inspire you. Yeah, absolutely. I think in many ways the work is 
um, work that inspires the girls, right? So they learn that, you know, this is how we see you as adults. Um, and I think in many ways as an adult working with them, I'm often inspired and I walk away from um, engaging with them knowing like, oh, wow, like I can do this. I think um, I learn a lot from them because I think a lot of times girls, young girls reject what society and what the media is telling them. Um, I think what, what I often see is adults are the ones that are actually making them buy into that when they themselves innately just reject what the media, what society is telling them. Um, and so a lot of times I'll bring up an issue and hear how they are hoping to address that issue or like they're thinking around how to respond to that issue. And I'm like, wow, you're so fearless. Like you're so empowered already. Um, and I think that that definitely puts me in situations where I'm like, you know what? I can do it. I'm, I'm a little scared of this, but I'm going to take that leap in the same way that this student just said that they would. Um, and so I think the programming that we do is definitely empowering for the girls, but also empowering for us as adults to see how they live life so freely, unapologetically, and how they show up as their authentic selves. And I think as adults, the more we nurture that in them, um, the more that they will actually navigate the world having internalized that, believe that. And I think it's almost like a cycle, right? We empower the girls, they empower us as adults, and then we empower society. Um, and so I think yeah. that that work is really powerful in that, empowering in that yeah. way. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Didi, how tough was it for you in your career? How, what, what barriers were really um, debilitating, if I may use the word, just, or you did not have that? How was it for you? Because you, you juggled so many different things. Yeah, I will say the most debilitating thing that I had to uh, live through was because I came from, I come from a uh, very traditional Chinese family and they have very uh, specific wants and desires for their daughters, <laughs> probably the same with Manal. <laughs> um, and they wanted me to graduate BU, go back to Hong Kong, uh, maybe get a very good job that they can be proud of and then marry a very rich man um, and then be a housewife and go shopping at Louis Vuitton, <laughs> whatever, right? That is probably the most traditional um, thinking, but I totally did the opposite uh, thing and I stayed in America and fell in love with non-Chinese men um, and my parents actually wrote to me, my dad specifically, uh, at the age of 25, he said, if you marry a non-Chinese man, we will disown you. And um, that's one part that was heartbreaking, but also the other part was um, another letter came in and said, uh, you will never make it in America because you are a foreigner. And so those two things, uh, and that my daddy is my hero. So, and I have a great relationship with him. So in a way that was even harder because I listened to every word he says, like I need to do whatever he says. And um, so it was a growing up uh, experience for me uh, to defy those two sentences because I ended up marrying a, a half black, half white man. And we are married, very happily married 19 years with four children. Um, and uh, I have made it in America because I am a foreigner. <laughs> so it's very interesting. Um, you know, of course, I can smile and laugh about it now. But during the times in my 20s, uh, late 20s and early 30s, I was really uh, trying to find myself and being bold and sticking to knowing that I know better for myself than anybody else. And so on this Women's Day, uh, I, I mostly, if you can take away anything that I say, it's really this, when a woman can be confident enough, like Ivana says, you know, to speak up and actually be authentic. Like you're not playing games with your own self, your mind, you know, you are going out there and willing to be vulnerable, willing to be uh, vocal and just being really comfortable in your own skin. That is the absolutely most important thing to be successful, because I think 
if you go out there, whom, whomever you talk to, one on one in a small group like this, or in a huge you know group with thousands of people that I, that I've done, you know, if people can feel your energy, when they feel your energy, that you're authentic and real, and you're comfortable and confident, but healthy confidence, not arrogant, right? That you can go out there and stand as a woman, especially in this day and age with our vice president being a woman, we, we have the trajectory of taking over the world, you know, and, and leading the way for, for so many people to see and, and get inspired by, um, you know, I encourage you to um, just be bold and, and stick to doing things for yourself and putting yourself first. I always say my biggest motto is be your own best friend. So however you would treat your best friend, you should treat yourself. Because if you are in a good place, especially being a mother, and I'm, I'm sure some of you are out there listening as mothers, right? If you are happy with yourself and your environment and what you're doing, then you create a very happy household. And, and you know, relationships, any relationship that you build, you can actually give joy. And I always talk about the you know, spreading gold dust into everybody that you come across. If you can, if you can actually carry those conversations and spread gold dust and lift other people up, not just on Women's yeah. Day, but on every single day that you do, <laughs> then you spread joy and the, in return, you get joy. And uh, by being yourself rather than being somebody else or trying to be somebody else. So that is, that is my main message for women of the world today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, uh, Minal, um, what about you? What, what words of wisdom do you give other women, uh, given you know, what, Nada, what you're doing? Uh, yeah. yeah, of course. So India is so different from you know, the US or the UK or Europe. And, Women here, you know, it breaks my heart so many times because they're not as empowered as the women that are, you know, in the rest of the world. Um, it's because of societal pressure. It's about generational pressures. It's about so much more. Um, and these issues are so intrinsic and they're so embedded in every woman here that most women, and I'm not talking about the 1%, okay? I'm talking about our 90% of our population. Most women don't think that they're worthy of most of the things. Most women don't think that they deserve to be happy. Most women don't think that they deserve to, you know, live freely or have an opinion or... I like in my off in our offices, okay, women still say, Oh, I don't know if I can come here if my husband will allow me to do it. It's still that mentality. They still feel that they need permission from the men in their life. And nothing breaks my heart and more breaks my than, that. than that. How important you know, is education you know, when you educate women, when uh, you give them the proper education, when the mother is educated, how how I think it affects the entire household so positively. Uh, it so makes I'll give you a huge difference. I'll give you an example. Um, we have a lot of female tutors on our platform, right? So um, a lot of these women can now sit within their homes, don't have to leave their homes and can teach children, right? So now they're automatically being empowered to add to the household income and to earn money for their families while sitting at home. So that, that empowerment, I have actually got so many DMs on Instagram being like, thank you for starting this platform because today, because of you, I can add to my household income. And because of that, my husband, my mother-in-law, my family respects me so much more. You know, they actually treat me as an equal now because I am a breadwinner and I'm bringing money into the house. So, you know, things like that where women didn't even think that it was it was possible for them are now being able to like go out there and actually, you know, make a difference. And it, there, there is a direct result soon as, a, you know, like, because soon as a woman is empowered and she's able to do these things and she feels that she can do things and she's confident um, to do it and feels that she can achieve it. And more importantly, is worthy to do it. Most women, like I say, don't think that they're worthy of love, of happiness. They're, you know, they think that, that they should be treated like this or it's okay for a man to talk down at them or like not respect their opinion. You know, so that needs to change 
um, you know, in countries like India, in I'm sure in Africa and many other South uh, South Asian in countries as well. Thing, yeah. you know, UAE, like everywhere, like we're not allowed to think that we're worthy or deserving. And I think that needs to change and that inherently needs to change in our society. And now with, you know, I hate to say this, but like men coming out and actually supporting women makes a huge difference. I hate that we have to be reliant on them and all of that. And, you know, we should be able to do it for ourselves. And why should a man come out and say this for us, you know? But at the same time, when they do say it in a place like even UAE or India, right? It, it holds a lot of weight when men see other men respect women. It holds a lot of weight. So, you know, it's, exactly. it's just an inherent change that needs to happen in our societies. Yes, of course, in the US and the UK, there are other types of problems that you have to deal with, like, you know, equal pay and stuff like that. India hasn't even gotten to like the equal pay part. You know, like a lot of other countries have it. Like we need, like yeah. I was not respected at most meetings I go into. They're like, oh, is your brother here? Is your father here? Is your boss here? I'm like, no, I'm the boss, <laughs> you know? So that happens all the time to so many women I know here every single day. So that societal change yeah. needs to come. Yeah, and it takes time. It's cultural, it's societal. And these take decades and and. It just, it's always work in progress and, and you just wonder when is it going to, to give us the result that we really need. Uh, Ivana, um, who inspired you when you were growing up? Uh, uh, who, who was your role model? Um, you know, you, you're probably a role model to these girls now. Who was yours when you were growing up and you said to yourself, you know what, this, I'm going to be like that because of so and so. Thank you for asking. Yeah, so I have a cousin who is pretty close in age, and I would say that she has consistently been my role model. Um, growing up, you know, we were born and raised in the Dominican Republic. I don't know how much folks know about the Dominican Republic, but it is a country that oftentimes um, denies their Blackness. Um, and I think when my cousin and I moved to the United States, it became really clear to us that we are Black women. Um, and that was actually an identity that we really leaned into, celebrated, um, and really took it as an opportunity to get to know a little bit more about who we are and what we truly believe in. Um, and she was the one that I think really paved the way for me to like learn more about that um, and just be able to like feel comfortable being myself. Um, she is someone who takes the positive risks that I think oftentimes we as women shy away from. Uh, she is someone who is not afraid to shake the table. So if something needs to be said that perhaps can cause there to be awkwardness or uh, perhaps it's taboo, she will say it. Um, and she is someone that just really uses her voice to shape the lives, not only of herself, but of the community. Um, and so I think for me, she has always been someone who has taught me what it means to be my authentic self um, and to show up and just like, uh, be real like right like if there is something that needs to be said she's always encouraged me to say it um and i think she just honestly embodies um this belief that if there's a change that needs to happen in your community you can do it um she actually yesterday defended her dis dissertation um which was actually on black girlhood so she is someone who i am just consistently looking to for advice for support um and who just serves as a guiding light for me yeah yeah that yeah you know and this brings me to the second uh theme of our discussion uh, which is what today means to all of us women. Uh, this year's theme is uh, breaking the bias. And uh, if we are on the way to achieving gender equality, uh, since you're talking about uh, the topic and, and being black and, and realizing this, how difficult has it been to, to break that barrier and prove yourself as a woman and not as a black woman? Yeah, I think for me, it, I feel like a lot of times something that I deal with oftentimes is imposter syndrome as a woman, um, because society sends all of these messages that, you know, you are not enough or you're too much or you're a woman, so you should just take a seat and you should be honored if you're invited to the table. Um, I think that that's something that I'm consistently just like fighting against, like this belief that I'm not enough, right? Um, and I think that the work that I do in empowering young girls also supports me 
and really just believing in myself and disrupting imposter syndrome in my own personal life. Um, I think it is difficult, but I've also learned to shake the table, right? And if there's not a seat at the table, pull up a chair and like make it my own. Um, and I think that that's what I've been able to do with this program in, in particular, right? Like in schools, there are no spaces that are essentially like super safe for black and brown girls to be themselves. Um, there are no uh, programs that focus at least locally, um, specifically on the experiences of black and brown girls. So I decided to create one. Um, and so I think that for me as a woman, um, it's definitely been difficult to be in spaces that feel good for me um, or that allow me to show up as my authentic self. And so what I've learned is, you know, if there's a need in your community, you can fill it. Um, if there's something that you see needs to happen, you can do it. Um, and I think a lot of times I'm faced with like fear and imposter syndrome. And instead of shying away, I'm leaning into that. Um, and I think as a result, I've really been able to create some meaningful experiences for girls that look like me. That's great. Uh, Didi, how difficult has it been for a Chinese woman uh, to, to make it? Uh, it's just, you're just not a woman, you're a Chinese woman. And, you know, I, I'm sure it has been difficult, especially uh, where you are in Hollywood. How has it been? Yeah, I actually, I'm, yeah, thank you, Nada. I actually would like to completely disagree because and I, first of all, I don't like to say anything is difficult. <laughs> I like to th say, see that as a challenge. And as I said earlier, I'm using the fact that I'm different or minority or Chinese or Asian, whatever you want to label it, um, to shine and bring in a different set of ideas, different cultural thoughts and ideas uh, to the table. And because Asian women are so seen as um, submissive and quiet and, um, you know, they're just book smart and <laughs> not street smart or they're not people smart. You know, we've discussed so many labels like I'm sure black and brown girls and even Indian and actually all of us here, <laughs> you know, we just have our own stereotypes that we have to overcome, right? So instead of, um, I put it on the table, I'm actually quite loud in the in the room. I'm not afraid to speak up and, and that actually kind of surprises people, but it's a welcoming, uh, fresh kind of, and freshness because the, the, the Chinese woman usually doesn't speak the Chinese woman but because I am a vocal person when I sit in a room with most white men Hollywood Jewish men right um, they actually love it because it, they, they they embrace the um, the feminine and the ideas that come through my mouth and um, probably because I know how to deliver what I want because <laughs> I do teach how people how to speak and, um, and pitch, right? And so when I pitch, people listen. So I, I would love to say to all those Asian women out there who are listening, like just because you're Asian, like show them that you're not the test stereotypes. Show them that more and more Asian women uh, in America, at least, um, are very much westernized, and and we we live just like any other white chick out there, right? And and I actually don't even say it as I'm Chinese or I'm Asian. I, I generally just go into the room as myself, as a woman, right? I don't say I'll, I'm a Chinese woman. I don't ever always bring up Hong Kong or bring up my background. I just go in there and be a woman. And then they can take me in as an Asian woman, a British woman, a Chinese woman, whatever woman they think I, I may be. So I actually feel very mixed as I you know, grew up in so many different countries. I feel very just me. I, I don't count myself as, you know, as a stereotype. I, I'm not specifically Asian. I'm not specifically British because I'm a British part, passport holder. I'm a British citizen. And, and you know, I'm not really American because I didn't grow up here. Um, so whatever you want to be, call me, that's who you are. So I flip it. That's what I'm saying. Like I flip yeah. the idea and the perspective and the stereotype and, and show them that I'm just Didi Wong, not, nothing else. And that's how yeah, I, no, I do no, it. I put a label on anything but a lot of times sometimes just from the way we look we give the first sure. impression and up until we start talking and and uh, uh, um, communicating 
uh, that's when we actually portray the message or relay the message that we are exactly. just all the same. We may look different. And this that's is right. what I was referring to because a lot of times your face is your first impression. And right. that's, you know, we'll right. take that as, because I look different as well. So this absolutely. is the first impression. And this is what I meant. I just. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Minal, do you feel the same way? Absolutely. I loved everything Didi said. And I'm usually exactly like that. I love people underestimating me and saying no. It makes me so happy because I'm like, yay, I get to prove you wrong. Um, I've dealt with enough stereotypes in my life. In Boston, I've dealt with enough stereotypes, especially when I, the day I reached Boston, the cab driver was like, oh, you're from India. How do you know how to speak in English? What? So it's like literally dealt with all of them. And I totally agree with her uh, 100%. I love shocking people. And I also use my diversity and who I am and where I come from as an added bonus and not something to look at as a negative or something that, you know, it's because of because she's Indian, she can't do this. I look at, I choose to look at it like because she's Indian and, you know, because she may have been well-traveled or this or that, she can add this to our team or to the project or can add value in this way. So I tend to see the positive as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, in the future, when it comes to Women's Day and, you know, the future of Women's Day, I just, I want to be in a world where we don't have to celebrate Women's Day, where every single day is Women's Day, where we're respected yeah. every single day, where we don't have to have women a month or a day um, or a specific time to celebrate us. We're just genuinely treated as equals. I don't believe I that men and women are equal. I believe we both have our four days and we should stick to them, but we deserve to have a level playing field. That's what I believe in. You know, like we should have the same opportunities. We should have the, have a seat at the table. We should have all of this. Like, even though like, you know, we read things like, oh, you know, now there are 500 women uh, founders that are unicorns or that have this or have that, but 500 is a very small number compared to every all the men out there, right? And also, when we go out to funding, please see the amount of women-led businesses that have got funding versus male-led businesses, right? So I hope things like that can sort of level up and, you know, we can all have an pl equal playing field so that we all have the same opportunities, so that it's not just one day, so that, you know, we're in this together forever and not just... For a particular day yeah exactly i agree totally uh, you know you said uh, that uh, things have worked out well for your business especially uh, during and after the pandemic how do you think the pandemic affected um uh, households um, um run by not run by women uh, headed by women um where the man is not there and the woman has to be the breadwinner and all that and how, how were you able to see the difference, especially through your business? So like I had spoken about a little bit about this, um, we actually empowered a lot of women because everything moved online. India is a system where the education system was primarily offline, right? No one really believed in online education at all pre-pandemic, nobody. It was very traditional. If you want a tutor, he has to be sitting across from you in your house, or you have to go and study at the tutor's house. Like it was very traditional form of learning. Online was something that Indian parents are very, very against. Also, our country didn't have the digital infrastructure to support online learning the way it does now. Um, you know, even things like internet connectivity and you know, most of India doesn't have access to laptops and didn't have access to smartphones and stuff pre-pandemic. The pandemic really uh, brought the digital infrastructure to the forefront, ensured that the government really invested in it, built it up. You know, now almost everyone has a smartphone, you know, internet access is being provided in rural India as well. So that allowed companies like myself, where we're providing education, um, to actually provide that education to all parts of the country. Um, women now, women, especially housewives, um, India is a country which predominantly has a lot of housewives because of, you know, like we spoke about all the societal pressures that we have, um, could be similar, you know, in Asia as well. But the problem was that now these women that had uh, working opportunities or would go and work part time, you know, uh, leave their children at home, go work part time, come back home now can't leave their home. So with a platform like ours, they were actually able to teach while sitting at home, 
earning extra income, especially when most of the other, comp- you know, their husbands had lost their jobs or their husband's salaries were cut by 30 to 40 percent during the pandemic. You know, so they were able to add to household income by being a part of, you know, our organization. We predominantly hire o- o- women as well. Mo- my sales team is only women. Mm-hmm. Okay, like 65% of my organization is women. So I, you know, employ a lot of women. We hire a lot of women, even for freelancers. I try opportunity as I possibly can to help them in any way I can. Um, You know, for example, I'll give you my current assistant. She started working in my family business as a receptionist. Her role was just to pick up a phone. Today, she's passed the bar exam. She's heading the HR department. She is literally like running things, you know? So I think that if women are just given a little bit of a push and a little bit of an opportunity, they do so much with it. So all the, you know, it gave, gives me so much pleasure. Like I was telling you earlier when housewives messaged me saying that, you know, I'm respected by my family and my husband respects me or my children respect me. I think to me, that is the most fulfilling thing that I can possibly do. Yeah, that's nice. That's really great. Uh, Didi, you do have uh, uh, girls, children. You have two girls or three girls? Uh, as have uh, four children, one boy and three girls. Three girls. Uh, uh, are they old enough to uh, talk about uh, what today means and gender equality? No. <laughs> and you... <laughs> not yet, not yet. My son is 11, my daughter is eight, and I have twins who are six. Oh, okay. Too but young. they will they will be talking about it. <laughs> I have okay. an eight-year-old girl who's actually very mature, and I actually told her, I was um, working out the posting today and she was like, mommy, what is this? And I was actually teaching her about uh, the International Women's Day. And I I posted some pictures of them and I was like, but it's women. And I said, no, it begins as you are a girl. So I was teaching her that last night, yeah. (laughs) All right, I think, uh, Katy, are we we almost out of time or do we have... uh... Questions, right? Questions. We definitely have time think, for questions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know where the questions are. Let me see. I actually have a question for Manal, if that's allowed. Because <laughs> I'm an audience member listening to you guys too, if I may. Because uh, earlier you were talking about how, um, you know, women don't feel worthy and women really are still not empowered in your country. Um, But so as a very strong and successful woman in India yourself, how do you, um, how, how, just give us a scenario like of a day perhaps when you go into meetings or when you talk on Zoom or like, how do you uh, begin to change that for women in India? Um. Okay, so when I am even like, for example, with my team, right, there are a lot of women in my team, even when I communicate with them and talk to them on a day to day basis, I tell them how important it is to stand up for themselves. Mm. So it's not something that you, you know, that they can inculcate in like a minute or two. It's something that you have to keep repeatedly telling them because it's so inherently inbuilt in them that they're not worthy or deserving. Um, So it's an everyday battle. It's not something that happens a day, a month, or a year, right? It has to happen constantly. You have to constantly remind them that they're worth it, that they are they can make their own decisions. They don't need permission. I mean, I also have to give a disclaimer that please don't go and fight with your husbands and blame it on me and being like, you know, my boss told me that I can't listen to you anymore and we're going to fight. So I tell them all the time, don't, no, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that you need to have your own opinion. It's okay to have your own opinion. It's okay to go out by yourself. You don't need your husband or brother or father to go out with you. You can go out with your friends. You know, it's things like this. Like I, you will find it funny, but it is, it's, this is a reality in India. Like yeah. women, a lot of women don't go out on their own. Women have to have like a fee, like a male, someone with them for them to feel safe to go out. Um, you know, their husbands sometimes don't give them permission to go out. It's, it's bizarre, right? Because Do you actually see the difference in them as you repeat this to them? That's so a lot of them. A lot, a lot of them wouldn't drink. So the first time I took them out for a team meeting, none of them drank. Maybe one or two had like a beer. Okay. Um, 
fourth, fifth time I went, okay, suddenly six, seven of them were having a Oh, drink. good. <laughs> I was like, okay, maybe I'm getting through. Maybe something is happening. These are very small examples. Sure, but, you know, sure. Even when they come, at, come to work, I feel like their confidence level is so much higher. Like I was telling you about my assistant, right? She is from the smallest, smallest, smallest village in rural India. So she had no exposure to everything. And now she literally runs... Uh, my life and you know our offices so if you just give women a little bit of a push and you know even while I go into meetings when I go into what uh, big meetings and people with like investors and stuff it's very different because usually um, they'll have different type of biases towards you not the generic biases you know I'm not gonna go into details about that but like <laughs> you you know, the kind of biases they have towards women founders and stuff like that. A lot of the times, in fact, I have had meetings with investors where they've said, oh, um, is your co-founder joining us? Or is your male co-founder joining us? Or are you sure you want to take this meeting alone? Do you not want someone with you? So I still have people say things to me like that. Mm -hmm. um, you still have to constantly prove yourself to people living here. Um, I've had when I, in my family business, when we have distributor meets with you know, say 200 distributors from across India. For our first distributor meet about five years ago, they thought I was a hostess there for to mm. serve them tea and coffee and, you know, all of that. So it's, it's, it's little things like that. And, you know, you just have to put your point forward and you have to make them feel that you know what you're talking about. I believe in letting my intellect speak um, and, you know, my work do the talking rather than really try and speak to men and try to change their minds because that's not happening overnight. Yeah. Um, I just let my work do the talking and I try to empower and speak to all the women around me as much as I can, because I said it's a daily struggle. Every day you have to speak to them. I recommend shows to them to watch. I recommend movies to them to watch. I recommend books, you know, anything to broaden their horizon, because for right. them, they're just stuck in their societies where, you know, you're surrounded by your families and your husband and your wife. I mean, you know, your children and all of that happening. So Thank you. you. Face yeah. the road. Yeah, I'm going to ask a question to all of you now, which is, and you can each answer it. What do you know now that you wish you knew back then? Uh, who, who would like to start? Uh, let's see. Ivana, would you like to go ahead and say? Yeah, I think one of the things that comes to mind is the fact that rest is the part is a part of the revolution, right? I think a lot of times as women, because we are trying to change the way that society views us, we're constantly on the go. Um, but I think for me, um, one of the things that I've learned is that you really can't give from an empty cup and you really have to pour into yourself and like really just make sure that you're nurture, nurturing who you are um, so that you can be well, because if we're not well, then we won't be able to pour into the next generation or into society. Lady Dee Dee. Um, I think really work on uh, your relationship with your spouse and um, the energy that you create behind doors, your foundation. Um, if you actually put priority, I mean, I definitely was out and you know, young and going out, but if I knew to pretty put a lot of energy inside and how to build a great foundation um, with children as well as my husband. I put a lot of effort into making sure my marriage continues to work. And um, I think that is really, because he is my rock and if my marriage is not going well, then it really reflects on how I operate in my other life. So um, yeah, effort with relationships, I think will be, would be <laughs> my thing. Okay, fair enough. How about you? I, I wish I knew when I started working, I wish I'd been more patient with myself. Um, I, I mean, now I've learned how to not too seriously. And um, also something that I really, really believe in, which I don't know if I really believed in or even new, but like today, something I really stick by is that there's always a solution for everything. So don't stress out. Yes. Uh, 
you know, every, we all stress out so much as a problem or whatever, forget the problem yeah. for solution. There's always a solution. So that's something yes. that I really, really stick by. Yeah, I think for me, it's just, I wish I focused more. For some reason, when you focus, you get things done more efficiently, maybe, and um, you dwell less, I, I think. Yes, but, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. But anyway, do we have any, any questions? Uh, let's see. Hmm. It's so cool to see so many people from different places attending this. Is I saw Egypt over there earlier. I saw England. I saw Maryland. It was. It's so nice to have everybody be here. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's really nice. Paris. Okay. Yeah. So Boston, of course. Well, I would like to thank all of you for this very inspiring um as as you said uh spreading gold dust um and inspiring and loving your magic there were so many nuggets in there for me personally so i am very very grateful to start my day off with such a boost um I would like to invite some of our participants uh, if you wanted to wish women um you know what do you wish for women please feel free to to put that in the chat we'll create a little word cloud um afterwards and send that with the the follow-up recording um so um you will hear from me uh, in the next few days with this recording so you can pull it out again and have that and that stardust uh, so to say and the gold dust sorry or, or stardust, stardust is um, good. <laughs> um to, at, at your disposal any time that you need a boost uh i I'm so grateful for, for all of you really spanning from around the world to, to be making this day so special. Um, as, um, however, you said it was, um, I wish that every day was Women's Day and it's up to us and um, pay it forward, um, be there for, for each other. And thank you again for, for being part of our BU alumni community and for empowering each other. With that, um, I uh, sign off and wish you a good night, good day, good afternoon, wherever you may be. Thank you again. Thank you, thank thank you, you so you. much. And Gary, thank you for organizing this and all your work and effort. Thank you so much. And Nada, thank you, thank you for moderating this for us. Yes, thank, thank you, you, Nada. Thank, thank you, you Katie. Thank you all of you. You're amazing. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Anna. Thank you. It was lovely meeting you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.